Hi guys, welcome to our first webinar. This week we're going to be discussing uh, the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework uh, and the concept of the landing zone uh, and why you really should be looking to uh, build your cloud infrastructure in accordance with this uh, to enable you to get the most out of it and to have the most secure when we come to talking about our data in our other sessions further down the line. So this is the first session. There is 10 in this series, and each week we'll be talking about a different concept, um, some different technologies, and how they all come together and align to your industry. So I'm Robert Cottrell. I'm a solutions architect at ANS, uh, and I head up data and AI in pre-sales. So the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework. So the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework uh, is in a, a proven uh, guidance from Microsoft uh, to enable you to create and implement a business technology strategy and really get the most out of your adoption of the cloud. So it covers these eight areas, as you can see here. First one being strategy. Obviously, any cloud adoption, you, you need to have a strategy in place for it. It's not something that you just want to jump straight it into. Both feet first, you need to plan around understand that business justification and what the ultimate outcomes are for adopting the cloud. Obviously, the cloud is a very versatile place to host your workloads, certainly in relation to data. Um, but there is some caveats for it. It's not always the uh, the, the best solution uh, for, for every workload. So you need to make sure that those outcomes are clearly defined. And then you've obviously got something uh, as a benchmark to uh, judge their success criteria as well when you move that workload. Second up is planning. Obviously, you need a plan to do this. Uh, certainly, if you're looking at moving uh, production workloads in there and not just proof of concepts, uh, you need to make sure that all of the uh, business stakeholders, IT stakeholders, uh, and the wider organization uh, are, are aware of what you're trying to do. And obviously, you align all of these resources accordingly to make sure that uh, you've got that adoption plan aligned with those business outcomes that were defined in, in item number one. Next is obviously ready uh, to, to, to where we, we need to prepare the cloud platforms. And this is where the concept of the landing zone really comes into it. So we'll be focusing more on this section uh, further in, in this, this deck, in this session. Uh, but this is where you need to build that landing zone. Obviously, you know, if you think of, of the cloud from, uh, from, from nothing, you know, you need to build that, uh, that environment to host your applications. You need to make sure you've got all of your core services, your security, your networking, your policies to make sure that it is, is governed and you've got some audibility between uh, what you're actually doing on the cloud. So you need to implement that landing zone and that's where that ready phase really comes into its own. Once you've completed ready phase, you should have the uh, the infrastructure, the platform uh, ready to go. It should be, uh, be able to accommodate multiple different types of workloads, not just data, uh, and give you the confidence that it still aligns to the wider security and governance that your organization uh, adhere to. Number four is, is migrate. Obviously, this is where you're now ready to migrate those workloads. Typically, most organizations start with a lift and shift approach uh, and maybe a little bit of, sort of remodernization as we go. And what I mean by a little bit of remodernization is they largely lift and shift their applications uh, into IaaS-based workloads. So lifting the AMs off, say, VMware, uh, Hyper-V or something like that into virtual machines in Azure. And where they typically tend to modernize is by swapping the backend uh, storage out uh, from a sort of a, a SQL database on a physical SQL server or an IaaS SQL server into uh, a PaaS based database server, so Azure SQL, uh, for example. And we'll be covering that in one of the later sessions in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, but that just gives you an idea of, of how most organizations attack that phase one of, of migrations. Section five is obviously innovate. Uh, and innovate is really where you, you've migrated your workload over to the cloud. It's been sat there, it's working. You know, it, it was a successful migration. It aligns to the original outcomes. But now it's time to go back revisit it and innovate on it. So how can we make the application better? And that can be a case of reducing costs maybe or improving resiliency. Uh, you know, be able to scale out automatically so it's not so much of a, a big monolithic application. It's actually, you know, uh, an application in multiple different small components that can scale independently. Uh, and that's where you go back. And that innovation cycle is something that uh, that should forever be, be repeating 
as new technologies and new services ultimately come out uh, and, and are available for you to, to adopt. Six is obviously govern, making sure you're governing the environment from day-to-day -day BAU workloads, you know, collecting logs, uh, collecting audit trails, having sort of a, an event-driven architecture in terms of alerting where certain changes happen, you know, making sure people who can access the environment are restricted, uh, and you're using some of the, some of the uh, capabilities that Azure Active Directory uh, sort of P1, P2 gives you such as the, you know, PIM access uh, and everything else. Number seven is obviously manage, making sure that, that your operations are scaling uh, in alignment with your adoption of the cloud. Obviously, there's a big, a big switch uh, in terms of adopting the cloud from your on-prem environments versus how you operate a, a modern cloud platform. And that's uh, forever more true when you uh, start looking at the data side of things as well, which is obviously what this series is largely going to focus on uh, in this session and, and the sessions to, to follow. Um, and, and the concept of really the, the, the data ops is what we'll be talking about. So obviously you, you've heard DevOps, uh, data ops is, a, is another sort of subset of that. And it really enables you to have that uh, sort of data operations and how you should be adopting the cloud platform moving forward. And we'll touch on this topic uh, each week as we go through these sessions. Certainly when we get to uh, to the Synapse one uh, and the data warehousing, which is the, the sort of main topic of focus for, for a lot of organizations, you know, how do they do that with code automation and getting the, uh, the most out of the environment? And lastly, is obviously organized making sure that the resources are organized and that you have got visibility of them as they grow. So as the workloads grow uh, and the environment gets bigger, multiple environments, multiple services, multiple teams and multiple third parties even, uh, how do you keep track of what's going on on there to be able to uh, successfully you know, manage that moving forward? So there are the eight steps of the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework. Uh, if we just move on, you can kind of see how this looks as a as, as a timeline transition period, uh, and again, how each of these sessions sections uh, cover those topics. So you know, it's, it's a framework that should be adopted by all. Uh, you know, you don't have to follow it to the letter on, on every section. You can cherry pick what what areas are applicable to yourselves, uh, and which obviously add the most value and where you are on that journey. Obviously, if, if you're just adopting a cloud for a proof of concept, you can be a little bit looser with some of these surrounding requirements. You know, if you are doing all the production workloads on this, you do want to stick quite closely to it because it'll ensure you get the best out of it and that you adopt the technology in, in the correct way and how it's intended. So obviously, you know, we start with that defining strategy, you know, look at the motivations of the organization, the outcomes, the justification, prioritization, what workloads are you going to prioritize on the cloud? Are you doing it because you are at capacity? You know, you've got a hardware refresh coming up or are you doing it to leverage the latest and greatest because what you can achieve in the cloud, you just can't achieve on-prem. And that's usually the case um, when you're talking uh, about data. You know, usually data is being used quite significantly on-premise, uh, and, and it's not that they want to fully move away from that, but it's more the services that are available in Azure, the AI, the ML, the auto ML stuff um, is, is uh, available to you, and it's much easier to use. So moving your data into the cloud closer to that, obviously, is going to give you ultimately a better, uh, better outcome. You know, plan for that delivery. What's the current landscape? How does it align? Is your organization ready? And what is that adoption plan? Can't stress enough how crucial having that kind of adoption plan is is needed. Certainly that, that roadmap as well, uh, where you're looking to go from the here and now, one year, two year, three years. It just gives you something to focus on and something to work towards as well, which is really good. Uh, that deploys obviously the landing zone, which we're going to cover in a lot more detail uh, in a minute. And that's the landing zone, best practice alignment, and you know, and, and being able to expand that landing zone to start from very small uh, and scale up to sort of an enterprise scale. Adopt obviously is migrations. That's if you work in legacy migrations um, in terms of data. So you, know, you might be moving a data warehouse, you might be moving some data orchestration, some data manipulation, or you might be starting from scratch, building from the ground up, but just pulling some 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 new data in some external data to see what you can do with it and then obviously you've got that innovate which loops your background for the plan and delivery and repeat obviously both underpinned by govern security process uh, maturity as you grow uh, and that manage as well from that bau service that operations baseline operations maturity whether you're going to look at sort of your devops um, machine learning ops or ai ops uh, and, and the difference really obviously be between those is devops being 
development operations. So infrastructure as code, automation, machine learning ops is looking at vast amounts of data uh, and making uh, decisions based on that data. So, you know, if you look at something like Sentinel, uh, you know, it's collecting logs from all different services, all different applications, it's segregating those logs, it's looking for trends, it's looking for analysis and will make the information available for you to make some recommendations uh, or to, to implement some recommendations off the back of that vast amounts of data. And then obviously AI ops is the, the latest really kind of in those ops phrases. Uh, and AI ops is really where it's it's leveraging that ML ops under the hood, but it's making the decisions and action in them itself. You know, it, it knows what it can and can't do. All of that data is going to decide what the best action is, and it will just go ahead and implement it for you. Uh, and obviously take that, that that operation burden out away from you while you're doing that. But ultimately following this, you know, certainly if you're starting from nothing, will improve that confidence uh, in, in your adoption of the cloud. So what is a landing zone? A landing zone is a term that's thrown around quite loosely these days and, you know, it really can't stress enough of how important it is to start with this while when you're adopting it even if you're doing a proof of concept in a new subscription or a new environment you know you need to you need to have elements of landing zone to, to, to be able to deploy those resources on top of you know, certainly an identity is, is, is a, a real core one uh, with this uh, but there's other elements as well which we'll talk, in, we'll talk about in a minute uh, but it should be modular you should be able to cherry pick the areas that you want and need uh, and you should be able to use it certainly for, for greenfield environments you should be starting for this but you should be able to overlay this back over brownfield environments as well obviously the cloud is is forever changing people who were early adopters uh, may have deployed it with best practice at the time not necessarily kept up with that as things have changed you know, new guidance has come out uh, and really you should be looking at making sure that you're still in accordance with that landing zone it provides a strong foundation for workloads certainly from a security and governance point of view um, because it it's, it's inheriting these uh, these policies that you've put in place from the ground up so auditing login you know making sure people can do what you want them to do you know don't spin up resources in outside of the uk for example uh you know making sure that certain users are, are, in, are inheriting those permissions all the way down and that's in there from from the base rather than having to ad hoc ensure they're in place for all different resources and applications you're doing it at that top level and, and that's been cascading down um, and you know it should be adapted to fit your requirements it's not something that you would just adopt over the top of everything and oh this is what you know Microsoft are doing this is what we're doing it's a you choose the bits uh, and adapt it to fit your requirements and what you're trying to do within those guidelines that are provided to you from that cloud adoption framework so there's three areas from a landing zone that you need to take into account uh, you know, we start with that core architecture plan. So, you know, identity and access is, is, is crucial uh, from Azure, you know, RBAC permissions, authentication, what can access, what what resources can access each other, you know, Active Directory, DNS, if you're coming from sort of, a, you know, an on-premise world in there, these are all core foundations that you need to have in place, you know, and then identity uh, and access will, will scale from that if, as soon as you set it up. To everything else you do thereafter all environments all resources will ultimately inherit this and will have some interaction with it those management services you know, how are you going to interact with these services how do you want end users third parties uh, to to access these environments you need bastion host jump boxes or are you just going to allow them to you know access the through a vpn or through the existing network kind of these decisions uh, ideally should be made up front just so you can uh, you know you can you can grow with it and you can build everything around it rather than trying to retrospectively fit it after the fact once all your networking's in place and you've configured everything it can sometimes be very tricky to go back and and undo that to implement these these services obviously your resource group planning how is that going to look have you got naming conventions for them tagging again is a really important one in the cloud you need to make sure that you've got it and this is certainly true from a from a data ops point of view which is obviously what we're, we're talk, really talking about today on top of this. Uh, you know, it, it's all all of the automation and the understandings from the governance is all done by tagging, you know, what criticality is this data? If I'm going to tag it as critical. Uh, and you can do some automation around that as well, uh, and some authentication restrictions in terms of who can access it, who can do what with it. Azure policies, again, is another good one that underpins this. 
uh, because that's really going to uh, limit what who can who can do what who can access what who can spin up what uh, what services people can use and they're really something that flows down obviously management groups tie into this really well uh, and your policies uh, pink hinge underneath those management groups um, which we'll cover a little bit of detail uh, in a further slide you've got your availability and recoverability at this point so you know what are you, are you trying to build to a, a certain availability certain recoverability using multi-region single region single region with availability zones uh, you know is data <coughs> data that needs to be backed up regularly or is it going to be done on an ad hoc kind of schedule these decisions kind of determine how big that landing zone is going to be and how big that platform is going to be as well uh, and if you're already deploying it and you've not got these policies in place or these defined uh, I certainly recommend that you go back and define them and try and because it's very difficult certainly from naming uh, conventions to go back and, 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 and align everything after the fact uh, but certainly tagging conventions is something that can be done so then you've got your core configuration. So these are your subscription structures. You know, are you going to have a subscription per business unit or a subscription per environment? You know, there's no right or wrong way to, to really do this. Um, you know, subscription is really a, a management boundary with, you know, uh, from a security point of view, but also from a resource uh, point of view as well. Obviously, there is some limitations in what resources you can play within the subscriptions. And you need to make sure that you've defined uh, how that's going to look obviously in alignment with management groups so management groups allows you to have logical units with subscriptions sitting under them and policies aligned to management groups that are automatically cascaded down and inherited you've got your naming policies to to make sure that those naming conventions that we defined above are enforced governance policies and standards in terms of making sure you know https is always enforced on blob storage um, you know it, it's 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 not allowed over the internet by default little things like that that just make sure that when something gets deployed it's automatically pulling best settings uh, or the best uh, setting down on it that means it's secure from day one and someone has to go in and manually uh, override that to make it less secure if they want to do something which that then falls nicely into logging and auditing because if someone does do that you want to make sure that you've got visibility of it you can see who's done it where they've done it why they've done it and again this is really important from that event driven architecture where you know if you look at your ai ops where you know log arting comes in that, that that ml ops is looking at all of this data if it sees something that it thinks is bad practice or you don't want and you set an alert for that that will automatically trigger something an event which will go on and automatically remediate it let you know tell you so you know you don't have to go and troll the log yourself there's a lot of capability there which will allow you just to turn it on and it will give you that that insight uh, very quickly data residency obviously a big one certainly when we talk around data um uh, and obviously this is, is quite around the, the your regions um so you know where's your data going to sit most people obviously want to keep it in, in, in the uk uh, but there might be some use cases where you want that data to maybe sit in the eu or not or a further field uh, but most of the policies are there to restrict that data of where you can and cannot deploy resources obviously you've got that availability and recoverability backup services and then those resource taggings just to make sure that they're in place backing up the data from day one and then can you deploy is automatically picked up within these services uh, and automatically um, taken care of so you don't have to worry about it it's a baseline baseline of service that you're, you're, you're enabling there uh, and again it takes away a lot of the uh, administration overhead to have to go in and, and manually configure them on a per resource basis it's obviously an, an administration headache as well having to keep track of all of those individual services that you've configured yourself in individually core networking again something that's that's potentially overlooked on the importance of it uh, but it's that core network and design hub and spoke architecture are you going to be using mbas and firewalls to traverse traffic and have traffic in the middle uh, you know the, the interpairing and routing uh, between services what's that gateway design going to look like are you having an express route are you having a vpn you know the network security groups in terms of what can see what who can access what um, interconnectivity and routing as well uh, and that public application presentation so you know, if you do have an application that you're deploying on this landing zone well how are people going to access it you know you're going to be using something like Azure your front door or WAF is it accessible over the internet you know is it globally accessible service how are you going to be presenting applications out in a secure manner um, and obviously that overall networking security all of these kind of play part to come together 
to, to, to have a, an impact on how that, that landing zone is, is going to look like. So they're the three core elements that you need to consider as you're going through the process of, of defining that, that landing zone. Uh, and ultimately, you look to end up with something a little bit like this. So this is uh, the enterprise scale concept uh, from Microsoft. And as you can see, it, you know, it looks quite complicated, quite big, but you know, this is really covering for, for, for a true enterprise scale. Uh, but you can cherry pick you know, the areas that uh, you want and how you want to break out. And this will largely be slightly different as well if you were to be doing it in a proof of concept because you can combine some of these services into a single subscription if you're planning to remove that subscription at the end of the proof of concept. So we start <coughs> with obviously A at the top, enrollment and your active directory and tenants. So obviously this is what underpins everything I said before, identity uh, and access is, is crucial to anything you do here. Uh, and this is typically obviously where you link to Azure AD, you link to, uh, or, you know, you have different departments, accounts, if you've got an enterprise agreement, slightly different if you're on a, uh, on a CSP. Uh, but fundamentally, this is where you create that tenant. So it'd be, you know, organization.onmicrosoft.com. Uh, and then you would link your Active Directory to that, <clears throat> which kind of gets you to that B section there. So that's your identity and access management, you know, your approval workflows, notifications, multi-factor authentication, uh, you know, privileged to access management. So we, uh, administrators can obviously only access resources when they ask for permission to, or that the access is only granted when they request it for a limited period of time before obviously it gets closed down afterwards just to stop any holes still being there from an administration point of view. So very important. Obviously applications that you deploy uh, are, are crucial for this uh, in terms of you know having that, uh, that application identity being able to talk to each other as well. Certainly from a data point of view, if you're using Databricks to try and access Synapse or vice versa, trying to access Synapse and Data Lake, uh, it all flows through that identity and access management to make sure the right services have the right level of access required for those services. <clears throat> C is obviously that management group structure. And as I said before, you can see how it cascaded down. So you've got your tenant root uh, management group there, which obviously then you've got your organization uh, top management group. So in this case, Contoso. Uh, and then below that, you've got multiple different um, platforms, environments, business units. So in this case, we've got platform, landing zone, you know, decommissioned and sandbox. And then below that as well, we've got multiple different uh, sort of uh, management group organizations. So identity management, connectivity, SAP Corp online. And below that, you can see where the subscriptions are sat for identity subscription, management subscription, connectivity subscription, etc. Uh, and obviously you can define this however you want to meet your organization. Uh, but fundamentally, you know, if you assign a policy to say Contoso, then everything below that will inherit that policy. If you uh, assign a policy to platform, everything below that will inherit uh, that, that policy. So, you know, let's say you have uh, different um, business units or different uh, subsidiaries of your company from, you know, uh, different ge uh, geo regions. Uh, you can have one for UK, one for Europe, one for the for, for, for States. Uh, you can have a different policy attached to each of those management groups that only allow their resources to be deployed close to that, that business unit. So identity subscription. So this is obviously typically where you would have any domain controllers deployed. If you were deploying them in Azure, typically you deploy two domain controllers. Uh, you add them to your on-prem receptive directory uh, and Azure becomes a, an additional site. Obviously you've got that link there through the connectivity subscription. Uh, and then you typically have your AD Connect installed on one of these, syncing those identities up to Azure. And this is also good practice if you're spinning up IaaS workloads uh, because it keeps all of the sort of inter domain control traffic within Azure and not traversing a, a VPN or an express route. Typically, again, you'd have some of your key vaults in here, uh, your recovery vaults, you'd have your cost management tools, your monitor tools will be deployed in here uh, for aggregating uh, some of those. Uh, those logs uh, and analytics as well. If you see some of the services there, which will be enabled, security center, network watcher, a policy assignment, role and name, um, et cetera, and you'd have those in that identity subscription. So again, restrictive, locked off. Uh, it's a subscription just dedicated to that, uh, and the people who need access to it will be granted access to it. Obviously, then you've got your management subscription. Again, this is where your IT administrators would likely go to use as a landing point, 
uh, you know, you can have some custom dashboards in there, you know, you can have some log analytics workspace, some additional tools uh, for your administrators to, to, to hit, get access to. Uh, and again, you can restrict it down and assign different policies to that than you do everything else. Connectivity subscription. So again, this is a bit that handles all of the connectivity in and out of Azure. Uh, again, you typically uh, have this VNet, you have a, a VPN or an express route connected from your on-premise into Azure. Uh, again, this example is using the virtual one hub, uh, which is obviously a new service from, uh, from Azure. You can have your extended DDoS protection, uh, your network watcher again is on this one security center, and any other services that would relate to uh, networking. Again, you could have your NDAs in here as well if you'd be using virtual firewalls to, to inspect traffic as it flowed in and out of Azure. Then you've got that landing zone subscription, uh, which is where you've got your virtual network, your load balancers, uh, you know, uh, any of the application um, would sit within this landing zone, uh, as well as you can see there, you've got your NSGs for your application one, two, three, uh, and this is where you would put those workloads. So you'd expect everything else to, to be in place or to be in place to a degree, and then you would deploy these landing zones as you needed them. So you know, if you're doing a proof of concept, would have one that was separated out. It could use identities, but it was restricted from having access to production workloads or anything else. You can see how that's happened on there with that sandbox subscription. And we finish on I, uh, which is obviously uh, quite an important one these days, which is that kind of DevOps uh, platform. Uh, and again, this doesn't sit in its own subscription, but it sits alongside everything else. Certainly, if you're adopting automation, DevOps, data ops, uh, everything should be covered from within that DevOps portal pipelines and test plans, code repositories, where everyone can have access to uh, and deploy from templates or making sure everything is kept up to date within that repository. So that's the concept of the enterprise scale landing zone. And as you can see, you can cherry pick the areas that you want. Uh, you know, not everyone will have their different identity management and connectivity broken out in this way. Um, but you know, it, it does give you that, that logical barrier uh, from a security and governance point of view, if you do break it out, you can obviously clearly control access to it from different users uh, and you can have stuff that is inherited from policies as well. But fundamentally, one thing to take away is all logs analytics should be stored in a, a single subscription that's um, isolated and locked, relatively locked down uh, so that you can have visibility across the entire platform. Any workloads that get deployed will get pulled into that and you'll be able to see what, uh, what what's going on and have that that full visibility which you need. So six design principles to, to really follow. You know, it's that subscription uh, democratization. So you know it should be treated as units of management uh, and scale aligned to applications or workloads. There's that policy driven governance in terms of you should be governing with policies uh, and doing that centrally rather than at the edge or at the application. You should be having some set of policies defined quite high up the chain. So this allows you to really open up the platform for anyone to use, you know, whether you've got a data team, an apps team, uh, an infra team or anything else uh, that can work freely within the environment, but pull those uh, governing policies down from above. You really want to stick with sort of a single control and management plane. So what you often see is third party companies do try and, and sell you a, an abstraction layer across Azure, you know, you know, come to our portal and, and we can abstract and, and do something else uh, on top of these join. It really just complicates things uh, and, and really takes away a lot of the flexibility that you get out of the Azure portal. Uh, obviously, the, the Azure management plane, you know, there's a, there's a variety of different ways to access it, but the portal, CLI, ARM templates, and all of these uh, come together as, as a unified, consistent experience for operations team. And it's something that you do want to be sticking with. So do try and avoid using third party abstraction layers over the top of it. You should be coming from a, a shifting your focus from an infrastructure sort of centric focus to an application centric focus. You know, the, the two worlds from on prem and cloud are, are different. Uh, and you do want to be looking at a more of an application, look at applications in isolation rather than where is this VM going to sit on my wider infrastructure because you will get a better experience and you will be able to control and be more efficient with costs as well. Try and pick services which align to Azure roadmaps. You know, uh, the enterprise scale champions that, uh, and it's it's building around the services which you know Microsoft are going to continue to 
uh, develop and improve over time and you want to make sure that you're aligning to those services within as your keep kind of one eye on new services where it's coming out usually you get a, a good enough grace period when they do deprecate service or shift focus to another service to, to be able to put over to that and you do want to make sure that you don't get yourself in a position where you're on service which is no one supported it's got limitations uh, you want to make sure you're you're doing that that move over to, to any new services over plenty of time and you want to start looking at this event driven architecture and i've said it quite a few times so far uh, on this call but it really is uh, the, the the future certainly from cloud platforms where events trigger automation which do an action and it, it allows you to have better visibility and quicker visibility within within the platform you know typically uh, you'll be able to see an event for within sort of a couple of minutes rather than waiting for someone to check an email inbox or do something else um, and it's something that you do need to do need to focus on so from a customer perspective you know why you would do this a uh, couple of you know six six options really so three on screen obviously you've got that standardization and consistency you know using the adoption framework and enterprise get landing zone uh, provides that consistent environment for you and your teams and partners to work in uh, and it, it will always ensure best practices ultimately adhere to it gives you this siloed architecture where you can separate out subscriptions applications and environments uh, to, to, to limit that attack radius you know, if security is, is, is a must for you, separating them out and having strict controls governed by uh, sort of your Azure AD and your, your monitor ballot log analytics is something which is crucial. Uh, and DevOps focus, obviously this is a, a big part of modern data platforms uh, and building, uh, building the architecture in this way will give you more control, it will give you more agility um, and it will, it's obviously it's a way teams are growing to adopt these tools uh, so by adopting now and adopting a framework which aligns to that nicely gives you the best chance of being able to swap the operational approach from the more traditional over to that DevOps focus and hopefully further down the line that ML ops and AI ops which is is really where you, you should be aiming to go. So it allows you to enable innovation you know rather than being stuck on services stuck on IRs that are very limiting you know, it's got quite high uh, operational overhead. You want to be looking at some of these new services that Microsoft are giving you to be able to be dynamic, you know, giving you global scale, uh, accelerate speeds to, 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 to the sort of market with, with new opportunities or new, um, new applications for your customers. And you want to be looking at what these new services can, can do for you to enable you to leverage uh, the data in a, in a much better way. And a great example of this is the sort of synapse in the ML studio where it really is kind of democratizing that data warehouse legacy architecture uh, but allowing you to be really flexible with your data uh, and, and automatically train machine learning models off your data to give you better and quicker insights you know you don't need to be a full-fledged data scientist to take advantage of these services in a lot of cases it's low no code drag drop with very intuitive interfaces uh, you know and you can do a lot with what you get out of the box allows you to mitigate risk obviously it's from a security point of view uh, you know you won't get security the same level of security that you would get some of the past services uh, that microsoft offer you uh, certainly with a landing zone coupled with those services and, and, and the log analytics and the monitoring really allows you to be uh, very strict and will eliminate that, uh, that, that that potential for risk or for, for your data being uh, being breached cost optimization as well is an important one uh, it's something that everyone I speak to uh, talks about, you know, cloud's expensive, how do I optimise that? Uh, and by, you know, using these platforms as a services, this machine learning and, and the constant optimization that it provides you out of the box is the best way to drive that, that, that total cost of ownership down. Uh, as I say, ultimately you pay for what you use and that DevOps automation mentality will allow you to power down most services when not, you're not using them and bring them back up when you, you are using them. Uh, and it's a you know it, it, it's an approach that you should be taking and you lose some of that capability if you stick to more of the traditional IaaS based workloads so there's a couple from a, from a customer perspective uh, of why you should be looking at using the cloud adoption framework uh, and the landing zone when you look at the landing zone from from data services uh, this is obviously uh, uh, a bit of a diagram I've mocked up to try and represent that for you but you can kind of see how you know from a 
a landing zone point of view, these subscriptions break out. So you obviously you've got your identity subscription at the top that handles all of your identities, application IDs. It's got all of your core services in there, your key vault, security center, network watcher. Um, obviously you've got your connectivity subscription that handles all of your data coming in, you know, whether we pull in IoT devices, uh, you know, IoT metrics, SQL data uh, from on-premise servers or from anywhere else, I'll hit that connectivity subscription. Obviously, it'd be a security center on there. Maybe it's your firewall, uh, you know, maybe using IoT event hubs. Um, that data will pass through there. And then obviously, depending on what you're doing with the data, you know, you could have a data warehouse subscription that you pull in legacy data from sort of line of business applications from SQL Server, and you're using that with Data Factory, doing some manipulation with Databricks, serving it up with Synapse. Uh, to, to have that that true data well. So whether you're doing some more of a, of a streaming analytics on, on, on an IoT, uh, you know, where it comes in and it's being processed in line, that's triggering an action, serving the data from an event thereafter. And you can see how these kind of break out and obviously can then be connected up where needed as well. Ultimately managed by that is your DevOps. So your, your infrastructure's code from your repository, that DevOps with pipelines being able to deploy the resources and manage the resources within these subscriptions. Uh, and then obviously you've got that management subscription at the bottom just to make sure that everything is adhered to, whether you're using monitor, sentinel, security center policies. Uh, this is how you know that that infrastructure should look uh, and should be brought together. So I'd like to kind of introduce you to um, an accelerator. So it's part of each of these uh, webinar series and in conjunction with uh, some of the Microsoft funding, uh, we're going to be producing an accelerator uh, aligned to the topic that was discussed each week. So obviously this one is for the, um, the landing zone. Um, and this is something that is designed to put that base foundation in place, whether it's a greenfield or a brownfield, that will ultimately underpin all of the proof of concept accelerators um, and concepts that we're going to discuss in the later weeks. So this is really that foundation tier just to make sure that everything is in place. So you can drop the proof of concept on top and you can take a slice of your data from on-prem, ingest it in, and ultimately you'll be uh, you'll be satisfied that you are getting security and governance that you need to be able to, to, to go through that proof of concept and hopefully move that into production uh, at a later day. We do have a, a lot of other accelerators. Obviously you can see some of them on screen here. If any of them are of interest, uh, do please feel free to reach out uh, and we'll be able to discuss these with you in a little bit more detail. Next up, Data Factory and Data Lake, Wednesday, 3rd of Feb, 1 o'clock, same time again. Please feel free to come and join us. Uh, that is the end of the session. Thank you for attending. Uh, if you do have any questions, do feel free to reach out uh, with the contact details on the screen uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.